The U.S. Hockey Hall of Fame has announced its new class. We've also got a big retirement in the NHL and our bi-weekly women's hockey spotlight. We've got all that and more on today's Locked On NHL podcast. Your Locked On NHL, your daily podcast on the National Hockey League. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, everybody, to the Friday edition of the Locked On NHL podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I want to thank everyone who makes Locked On NHL your first listen every day. Don't forget to subscribe on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts so you never miss an episode. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NHL for $20 off your first purchase. I'm Gil Martin from Locked On Islanders. With me every Friday, Rachel Donner from Locked On Flyers. Happy Friday, Rachel. Hockey, this close to coming back. This close. Yeah, we get a rookie training camp start next week for most teams. So uh, excited to get going. Yeah, can't wait. It's, uh, It's an exciting time of year for hockey fans. The weather's getting a little cooler. The days are getting a little shorter. And players are starting to show up. Uh, you know, at training camp facilities to start preparing for the new hockey season. But before the new season gets underway, some news from the U.S. Hockey Hall of Fame. They announced their class of 2024. Your initial thoughts on this class? Yeah, it's interesting because the U.S. Hockey Hall of Fame is different from the overall Hockey Hall of Fame Uh, based in Toronto. So obviously this is just Americans, but um, you know, sometimes it's a surprise to me and sometimes it's not. I think Brianna Decker is a shoe in. We're going to talk about her in the women's hockey spotlight, but I absolutely love them honoring a guy like Kevin Stevens, who was a journeyman, right? Like didn't really stay in a particular place for the longest time, but I think that he's just like a mainstay of USA hockey and had a really strong career. And just to see him honored by the U S hockey hall of fame is really cool. Yeah. And you know, he definitely had a a great career. I mean, again, not uh, a superstar, but definitely one of those players who helped any team he was with one, two Stanley cups had, a couple of Mm -hmm. hundred plus point seasons, a 55 goal season, uh, which back in 1992, 93 was the record for an American born player. And, you know, also since he's retired, I mean, he's still working for the Pittsburgh Penguins organization as a special assignment scout. So, you know, even though his playing career ended years ago, he's still been involved with the sport of hockey and, and, you know, that's always encouraging to see. So yeah, definitely uh, a very deserving first choice there uh, on this list, but uh, Matt Cullen also getting recognition, a Moorhead, Minnesota native, three time Stanley cup champion and eight different teams in 21 NHL seasons. Yeah, I think uh, that is really cool to see him honored. Um, You know, obviously his longevity in the league is a huge deal. Uh, Played over uh, 1,500 games in the NHL. And uh, I think, you know, one of the earlier, like, prominent USA superstars uh, to play in his era. Yeah, yeah. And that longevity is impressive. I mean, not a lot of players play 21 seasons in the NHL. He's only he's one of only two American born players to play more than 1500 regular season games. I mean, these are uh, again, you know, maybe he wasn't the best player on the teams that he played for, but he was always one of those guys that was important to his team's success. And, and really did contribute to it. And, you know, one of those guys where if he played for your team, you kind of realized how good he was. But if he did, never played for your team, you kind of you know, may have gotten lost in the shuffle a little bit. 
I like the fact that he's getting honored for his contributions now. Yeah, I think that is just a really cool thing to see. And then the the other inductee, uh, one in the builders category, Frederick McLaughlin, who purchased the Chicago Blackhawks all the way back in 1926 uh, and is is kind of responsible for the team's nickname and and, you know, was active in the Blackhawks organization all the way until his passing in 1944. He's already in the Hockey Hall of Fame since 1963, and I, I, I think it's appropriate that he is now in the U.S. Hockey Hall of Fame as well. Yeah, I think it is interesting. You know, they posthumously uh, got him in the Hockey Hall of Fame, but the fact that it's taken, like, 60 years later for the U.S. Hockey Hall of Fame uh, to to induct him. So I think that, uh, you know, seems long overdue and there may be some living people that should uh, get moved up on the list, but also maybe important to kind of rectify a, a wrong that has been sitting there for a while, because obviously with the Blackhawks being an original six team, the team having that history, like you have to think that the founder of that team should be in the U S hockey hall of fame. Yeah. And then, you know, there's another sort of interesting fact and, you know, again, owns the team from 1926 until 1944. There were not a lot of Americans in the NHL at that point in time during the days of the original six or even before the original six, where you had more than six teams in the league, but those teams eventually folded. And yet, you know, he was a, a guy who tried to sign as many American born players as possible. And that number really didn't pick up again until you get into the late sixties with expansion and then the WHA coming in the seventies. So here's a guy who was a little bit ahead of his time in sort of promoting American born NHL players. Yeah. I think that's an important part of his legacy as well. And, and you know, what could be more fitting for the U S hockey hall of fame than a guy who's trying to promote the, the, the you know, American born players into the league. So we will, uh, you know, that is definitely a, a, a plus there. And uh, congratulations to the class of 2024 from the U.S. Hockey Hall of Fame. We also. Well, there's uh, one more. There's the 2002 oh, yes. Paralympic hockey team. Yes, I am sorry. I forgot about that. And that is a great addition. You did watch the 2002 U.S. Paralympic sled hockey team. Why don't you tell us a little bit about it, coached by Rick Middleton? Yeah, it was so fun. So I have said on this show multiple times, I lived in Salt Lake City for a number of years, including in 2002 during the Olympics. And it, it was just so amazing to be around during the Paralympic Games as, as well. And I know like a lot of the attention sometimes fades away during the Paralympics. But because I was there, I had the opportunity to watch several events. And uh, I did get to see sled hockey. Um, I had tried sled hockey myself when I lived in Utah um, at the rink up in Park City. It, it's a big part of the programming there. And so I just I wanted to see it in person. And um, it's an incredible sport. It's very difficult. Uh, I completely failed at it myself, <laughs> uh, trying to play. And uh, the the fact that it was finally part of the Paralympics um, to add hockey to the competition. And this was just a tremendous team. They wound up winning the gold medal um, in a shootout uh, and in very dramatic fashion. And I'm so happy for everybody on this team. Yeah. And great to see them get recognized by the U.S. Hockey Hall of Fame. It, it is a very difficult sport. Uh, playing on the sleds and and they did such a great job and uh, again that was sort of the the first uh time that the u.s started a long string of successful years in the paralympic games so these guys not only accomplished the gold but also sort of set a precedent yeah they did and like usa paralympic you know hockey u.s sled hockey um, you know, they have a, a tremendously difficult legacy to live up to with all the success they've had. And 
Uh, we know our friend Ann Kimmel over at Locked On Predators is a huge supporter of the program. And so for any and all information about them, she's a great follow as well. Absolutely. Well, we have got a lot more to discuss on today's show. We have uh, a prominent NHL veteran hanging up his skates. We've got some uh, information on the funeral of the Goudreau brothers. And Erica Eliala will join us for a women's hockey spotlight. We've got all that and more coming up on today's Locked On NHL podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by your friends at eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, You'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay Guaranteed Fit, only available to U.S. customers. Rachel, one of the Stahl brothers, Mark Stahl, hanging up his skates after a very long and productive NHL career. Your thoughts on the retirement of Mark Stahl? Yeah, so his last team in the NHL was the Philadelphia Flyers. So I got to cover him in his last season. And I think that, you know, he, he had a really good attitude in his last year uh, about his role on the team and that sometimes he would be sat and, you know, when he was going to be uh, iced, it would be for a particular reason and particular strategy. And I think that it really helped that Mark uh, had worked with John Tortorella before uh, just because, you know, he, he had a good relationship with him. So if he wasn't going to play every game, I think it was, clear that it, it was okay, but he just seemed like a real um, strong leader in the locker room and a, a really good asset to have when mentoring some of the younger defensemen on the Flyers. Um, obviously, that time on the Rangers where he did overlap with John Tortorella was the most prominent part of his career, right? Yeah, uh, basically spent 13 seasons with the Rangers, also played for the Red Wings and Panthers, 1,136 career NHL games in 17 seasons. And, you know, it, it's kind of amazing that the Stahl brothers are starting to wrap up their NHL careers. Yeah, there's only one left Yeah, <laughs> in the NHL in... Um... Jordan is is the the one left. The last and, stall uh, standing. <laughs> yeah, which just sounds terrible to say. Yes, it does. <laughs> but uh, I think that you know, for Mark, you know, to have a career to go to age thirty seven is a huge accomplishment, and uh, I think that it's uh, he has a, a really strong history, and I wonder if he'll be a future inductee. Uh, into the Hall of Fame. It will be interesting to see if he does make the Hall of Fame. I mean, here is a guy that played a long time in the National Hockey League, 17 years, not a member of any Stanley Cup teams or all-star teams, but boy, was he steady over the course of his career. Not going to make the U.S. Hockey Hall of Fame being no, from because he's Canadian. Ontario, but, <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, but, you know, he, he really was a, a very steady presence uh, throughout his career. And uh, I think he'll fall short of the Hall of Fame, but I think he deserves more consideration than maybe some people would think right off the bat. Yeah. And, you know, he is, uh, you know, continuing his career in hockey. Um, he's going to be with the Rangers again as a player development coach, which I I think makes sense. A lot of guys like him do that 
uh, once they leave the game. And uh, so I think that that'll be a, a really good next step for him. Yeah, and we certainly wish uh, him all the best in his next endeavor. And it's good to have him staying in the game. Sad news, uh, continuing with the Goudreau brothers, uh, their funeral arrangements have been set. And uh, I'll, I'll let you talk a little bit more about this since you're from that area. Uh, but uh, yeah, the funeral is going to be taking place on Monday. Yeah, uh, it will be. And it is going to be at a church uh, in the Philadelphia area in the Pennsylvania suburbs. Um, the Columbus Blue Jackets, I believe, will be live streaming it uh, on their website so that more people can uh, join in the service. I, you know, the school that's attached to that church canceled school for the day just because of everything going on uh, there. But it's just been, you know, since it happened, we talked about it last Friday, just like hours after the news broke and the continuing outpouring of support and love for this family has just been uh, so remarkable and so heartwarming to see, you know, the, the guys earlier in the week talked about Cole Caulfield changing his number to 13, uh, which is an incredible gesture on his part. Um, and the candlelight vigils that the Calgary Flames and Columbus Blue Jackets had uh, were just beautiful and seeing, you know, different players and management talk about both of the Goudreaux's um, and what they've meant to their communities. And especially here in, in South Jersey, uh, in the Philadelphia area, uh, where the Goudreau brothers grew up, um, you know, the Hollydale rank has been kind of a home base source of comfort for a lot of people uh, in South Jersey. And um, I, I've just been overwhelmed by all of it. Um, seeing Boone Jenner and especially Eric Goodrinson talk in the um, Columbus candlelight vigil, Michael Backlund spoke in Calgary and, uh, you know, just the, the number of people that showed up at both of those arenas is tremendous. Um, and I just think that, the, the teams have been doing a really good job giving fans their players and everybody around it, just the space to, to mourn in the way that they need to. Yeah. I mean, this is so difficult to process and difficult to come to terms with. And obviously the Goudreau brothers touched a lot of people during their two brief lifetimes. And uh, you know, that just makes the loss that much more tangible when you see how many people have been affected by these these two brothers who did a lot with not a lot of time on this earth. Yeah, they were loved by a lot of people, and it's an incredible legacy. No doubt about that. We have got more to get to on today's show. Erica El Ayala will join us for our Women's Hockey Spotlight. We've got that and more coming up on today's Locked On NHL podcast. Some of the best concerts of the year take place in the summer leading into the fall, and it's my favorite time to head to a show. Game Time has a new feature called Game Time Picks that makes getting tickets for your favorite live events even easier. Game Time Picks filters out the fluff to show you only incredible deals on great seats so you don't have to waste time searching through thousands of tickets. My favorite part of the Game Time app is that it's great for getting notified about last minute deals and super deals so you know you're getting the best bang for your buck. Best of all, they have all in pricing so there's no surprise fees at checkout when you activate that feature. Also, your tickets are sent directly to your phone so you never have to dig through email. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code Locked On NHL for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem with the code Locked On NHL for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. What time is it? Game time. And now, Erica El Ayala with our biweekly women's hockey spotlight. Hi there, everyone. Erica El Ayala, your host of Locked. 
the Kraken, and also host of the Women's Hockey Spotlight here on Locked on NHL. Now, we have a lot of cool things to talk about when it comes to women's hockey, specifically the Professional Women's Hockey League, PWHL, including that two of the franchises will be relocating to new arenas. The PWHL Toronto team played their games, the majority of their games, at Mattamy Ice Center, historic venue in Toronto, very beautiful, but very limited when it comes to seating. Now, they are going to be moving to the Coca-Cola Coliseum, PWHL Toronto General Manager Gina Kingsbury said in the press release, we look forward to creating an atmosphere that will be a unique and special sporting experience unlike anything else in Toronto. And the Coca-Cola Coliseum is where the AHL team for the uh, for the Toronto Maple Leafs, the Marlies, that's where they play. So this should be an increase in the ability, at least, to have more fans in the stands. Mattamy was by far one of the smallest venues in the PWHL last season. It was also announced that PWHL Toronto or excuse me, PWHL Montreal, we just talked about Toronto, will play at Place Belle, and it will be their primary home next season. They played six times in La- uh, Laval, Quebec last season, and the majority of their games were held at the Verdun Auditorium, which is a, a suburb of Montreal. Place Belle is also the home of an AHL team, the Laval Rockets, and that is the affiliate of the Montreal Canadiens. The capacity is about 10,000, so definitely gets the PWHL much closer to roughly what they were averaging in attendance last season. So those are pretty good moves when it comes to being able to grow the game. Now, what we haven't heard yet is where the PWHL New York team will play. They also split some time, including kind of ending their season in New Jersey, which quite honestly I think was probably their best venue just given the landscape in the area. But we're still waiting to see if and when they have an announcement regarding where they're going to play and how that might impact their ability to sell out the arena. I also want to talk about PWHL Minnesota. They announced Melissa Caruso will take the role of general manager. Also an AHL connection, Caruso was with the AHL for the last 15 seasons, uh, most recently as the vice president of hockey operations and governance. Melissa's strong background in operations and government and governance, excuse me, combined with her extensive hockey knowledge and leadership experience, make her a great fit for the role. Jaina Hefford, PWHL Senior VP of Hockey Operations, said in the press release. Now, what we also saw reported is that Ken Klee will remain head coach. And the reason that that might be a little bit controversial, especially for PWHL Minnesota fans who got to celebrate a championship and then quickly were disgruntled about the dismissal of um, who will now be Hockey Hall of Famer Natalie Darwitz. Um, There was a little bit of tension and a lot of things reported and allegations that Ken Klee, who served as the head coach, on the back end of last season was perhaps uh, a little bit inappropriate with some of the comments, nicknames, things of that nature. We've talked about this on women's hockey spotlight before. So as of right now, there is, it would appear no change in the head coach. Although again, there have been reports and allegations that Ken Klee made PWHL Minnesota a very toxic place. And that Natalie Darwitz was one of the people standing up, for the players who, again, were alleging some just inappropriate or unprofessional conduct and and, uh, language used by Ken Klee. So we'll see if and where that goes anywhere when it comes to the PWHL Minnesota team. Now, I also want to go over to USA Hockey because they announced their Hall of Fame Uh, their Hall of Fame honorees when it comes to their most recent class, the class of 2024. Brianna Decker, 
Olympic champion Bree Decker and uh, alongside a few other players, um, all men. So most of them coming from the NHL side of things. Um, Brianna Decker uh, helped the U.S. win gold in South Korea in 2018 and was part of the silver medal teams in 2020 in 2014 in Sochi and 2022 um, before she had a very disastrous injury. She broke her leg early in the 2022 tournament in Beijing, and we really haven't seen Bree Deck since. And um, it was a broken lens, leg, several torn l- ligaments. And, uh, you know, Bree Decker for me has got to be I know we talked about Amanda Kessel before, but before Amanda Kessel, there was Brianna Decker. And I know a lot of people know about Hillary Knight, but Decker played right alongside Hillary Knight. A lot of the accolades that Knight has, Decker also has. And for my money, Brianna Decker is probably one of the best centers that we've ever seen for USA hockey on the women's side. She was a part of six world championship titles. She was MVP and leading scorer once in her career at the international level. She went to Wisconsin where she led the team to a national title in 2011. She did play in the NWHL and won a championship, the first ever, the inaugural season with the Boston Pride and was MVP of that tournament as well. So stick taps to Bree Dex on what has been an amazing career and congratulations on being tapped to the U S hockey hall of fame class of 2024 before signing off. I want to give some stick taps also to an amazing writer, an amazing advocate for women in hockey and someone that I like to call colleague and friend that is Dan Rice stepping away from hockey reporting after 20 plus years of writing in the New Jersey area, the metropolitan area, if you will. He has been a huge champion, as I said, for women's hockey and is stepping away just to do other things. For those who don't know, it is very difficult to make it in sports media and the hockey landscape, and even more specifically, the women's hockey landscape. So thank you, Dan, for everything that you've done. Thank you for always being a good friend to me. It's been an honor to work in scrums and on broadcasts with you, and I wish you the best and all the things that you have, all that free time that you're going to have. That's our Women's Hockey Spotlight. Again, my name is Erica El Ayala, your host of the Women's Hockey Spotlight, and of course, Locked on Kraken. And we will catch you for our next spotlight in another two weeks. All right, that's going to do it for today's show. I want to thank Erica El Ayala, as always, for joining us. I want to thank you for making Locked on NHL your first listen of the day. For your second listen, check out Locked On Fantasy Hockey, which will provide you with all the tools you need to pick your fantasy team and maintain it throughout the season. It's available on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm Gil Martin. I will be back on Monday interviewing three of our local hosts with some of the biggest stories from around the NHL. Have a great weekend, everybody. Stay safe, and thanks for listening to and watching the Locked On NHL podcast.